today. Uh, I'm sure you know her already. Uh, she was one of the legends of the Game of Thrones community. Uh, Gemma from Secrets of the Citadel, do you want to say hi? These, these accolades that you're giving me just get better and better every week. One of the legends of the community, I'll take it. Thank you for having me on, Robert. It's always a pleasure. I'm really excited to talk about the wars to come today. Very exciting topic for me, this one. Uh, excellent. And uh, I, when talking about legends, we are talking about one of the legends of the world of ice and fire. Sir Arthur Dane. Now, um, as always, we're going to, if, if you've got any questions, just drop them down there in the chat. We'll try and get a, to as many of them as we possibly can. Uh, I've got a, a couple of questions from my patrons that we'll try and get to. And if there are any super chats, obviously, we'll get to them straight away. But let's start off by talking about House Dane as a whole, because this is one of the most intriguing houses. It's one of the, the, the houses that people talk about the most when we're theorizing about what really was going on, particularly with the Tower of Joy, but, but much wider in terms of Robert's Rebellion. So uh, Gemma, do you wanna just give us a quick rundown, some sort of broad history of House Dane? Who are they, what are they about, and, and, and who are the main members that we should be a member? aware of okay um summarize this crikey um how do i put this as tightly as possible i mean we're talking a minimum of ten thousand years worth of noble houseage here um they're from dawn um if davos dane had not been the third husband of nymeria house um dane could be ruling dawn instead of house martel right now but that's another issue issue of succession altogether um basically the story goes is that the first dane followed a falling star to the mouth of the torrentine river um and where the star fell like a meteor he created star for the seat of their house and of course the legendary sword dawn was made from the falling star or the, the, the heart of a meteor so it's like a, a meteor sword it's like the coolest thing but we'll talk about that again in a while um so yeah the they have a very distinctive kind of valerian vibe going on with their features the way they look um famous members i mean in the story that we know right now um there is obviously sir arthur dane the sword of the morning we've got ashara dane there's a lot of theories surrounding her um historical figures i've mentioned davos dane there was um ulrich dane he was also a sword of the morning and vorian dane known as sword of the evening which is I definitely want to talk about that in a little while. Um, and of course, Darkstar and Edric Dane. They, they, they're the only two living Danes that we actually have in the story. Was that it? Did I summarize that okay? <laughs> that absolutely perfect. So we, we have House Dane, who are an ancient house. They're 10,000 years old. They are first men. So they've got this kind of first men blood about them. And they've also got a slightly otherworldly kind of aspect to them with this sword dawn, which is not like a Valyrian steel sword. This is forged from a fallen star. Now, one of the uh, drivers of magic, sort of the influence of magic in the world of ice and fire appears to be things from the heavens where we see comets going across and and that seems to be a herald of great magical change and so when we get a sword which is forged from a fallen star from from a meteorite then that is a very magically powerful sword so you, you mentioned about the the eyes yes so the house stain they seem to have purple eyes which are very valerian like but i i think george R. R. martin has said that they don't have valerian blood about them so there's a uh, there's there's a sort of a hint of the valerian about them the hint of the magical but really what they are is a uh, a, a descendant of the first men with an incredibly magical sword that is over and above the valerian steel swords so 
you mentioned a few of the characters. Let's just pick up before we we're gonna. This is we're gonna major on Arthur Dane, but before we get onto him, Ashara Dane is mentioned so much in the build up to Robert's Rebellion. Do you want to just let us know a little bit about? And, and Ashara Dane is the sister of Arthur Dane. Why is she seen as so important in in the build up to Robert's Rebellion? Do you know what? I, I'm going to disagree with your statement right there, Robert. I'm afraid. <laughs> no, it's, keep going. You just said Ashara Dane is mentioned so much. She's mentioned three times by name in the first book and ten times in the entirety of the Song of Ice and Fire. I wouldn't say ten mentions across all of the books is a lot. I was I was meaning <laughs> rather than in the books. In the books, I would agree. Yes, she's she's the, uh, yeah. mentioned a few times in the books, but in the community, she's seen absolutely as a central figure who is perhaps not mentioned as much in the books as she as as is her impact within the the theories that we've got about what was really going on. So sorry, I didn't quite explain. No, no, no. That's no, I, and that's where I was going. Essentially, I think this is something that we as a community have really taken by the, I don't want your video to get demonetized, so I'll backtrack on what I was about to say there. But yeah, we've taken ownership of Ashara Dane, haven't we? And I mean, the theories, goodness me, because where there is mystery, there is speculation and and room for theorizing um and and house dane and particularly ashara dane there is so much mystery that surrounds her i mean which stark did she look to is she daenerys's mother is she Jon snow's mother is she even dead there are so many questions about ashara dane and and yeah a few people in the chat um, i if, if you're not familiar i am always purple it's it's a thing with my camera i have tried to get a new camera and everyone's told me up and said no they want me purple so <laughs> Until that day, we're just going to have to suck it up. I'm not really purple in real life, though. But maybe I'm just embracing my inner Dane for this chat today. <laughs> I, I, I did push Gemma before this about whether she was going to get a new camera, because I think this is just a camera issue. I think she, she just, if she gets a different camera, it is. perhaps it will show up the, 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 the glorious red kissed by fire hair that she has uh, but um no she's she's the purple lady and very proud of it um so ashara then yeah i would agree she's she's not mentioned huge amounts in the books but when she is it seems quite important right down at the very the very first few chapters of a game of thrones you see that uh catelyn is very uh, aware of Ashara Dane, and she is convinced that Ashara Dane was Ned's lover, and there's an implication of jealousy there that has carried on all the way through their marriage, leading to the fact that she is preventing anyone from mentioning Ashara Dane's name. Somebody that Ned Stark has not met for 20 years, perhaps, or 15 years, or whatever. She is just preventing people from even mentioning the name. So she is clearly a very important character in the backstory to what's going on but as far as we're concerned she is the sister of arthur dane now arthur dane is the he was known as the sword of the morning and this was an honorific given to various members of house dane if they were worthy they were given the sword the magical sword dawn and they were then given the honorific, the Sword of the Morning. Now, this didn't happen in every generation. You had to show that you were worthy to receive the sword. So one thing we know about Arthur Dane was that he was worthy of bearing the sword. He was a, he was a good fighter. He was a legendary fighter. We, we know that, um, uh, for example, Jamie Lannister looked up to him immensely as a fighter. But what else do we know uh, Gemma, what else do we know about Arthur Dane as a person? Yeah, this is the thing, isn't it? I mean, and in the same way that we've taken ownership of Ashara Dane, we've done the same with Arthur Dane. We actually know so little 
about Arthur Dane. And yet Winter is Coming ranked him in a poll as the greatest swordsman in Westeros. This is a character that died many years before the story even started. And I love how these dead characters resonate with us and have such an impact within the fandom and on the story. I mean, we don't even know what Arthur Dane looked like. We literally, we, we don't, we assume that he's he was average because there's nothing of note that's been pointed out by anybody. And there are plenty of characters in the series that, that reminisce about Arthur and think about him. Barristan Selmy does, you mentioned Jamie Lannister. And, and at no point do they mention his purple eyes or his silver hair or he, that he was very tall or that he was very short. There's, there's nothing of note that's, that's picked out at any point. If you Google artwork for Sir Arthur Dane, it's, it's all over the place. I mean, because we, we genuinely don't know, but we can pick out things um, there was the incident with the Smiling Knight, and we'll probably look more deeper into that soon. But um, because he was using Dawn, he nicked the Smiling Knight's sword so many times that it was basically a ruin. And Arthur Dane gave the Smiling Knight the opportunity to pick up a new weapon. So that would suggest a degree of, of chivalry, very much chivalry. Um, there's a, a comment from John Connington's thoughts about the Golden Company. Um, it was a camp that even Arthur Dane might have approved of, compact, orderly, defensible. And I'm wondering, do, are these traits there for that are connected with Arthur Dane? But this, this, these, these little snippets is is all that we can get because obviously John Connington also knew Arthur Dane. Um, he was diplomatic. He worked with the small folk to gain favor in the name of his king. But other than that, we don't um, we don't know much. What we do know, and this is why we trust that we feel we know him, is because we get information about him from other people that we actually trust, like Barristan Selmy. I know Jamie Lannister's got his problems, but but essentially when we're in his point of view, when we're inside his mind, we, we trust how he feels and the things he thinks. Um, same with Barristan, and, and they have a, an extremely high opinion of him. Ned Stark too, again, another character, point of view that we trust the opinion of. So really that's where our vision of Sir Arthur Dane comes from, and, and these are all men that we, we trust their word. So I think that's why he's he's as huge as he is, despite the fact we, we actually don't know anything about him, really. Yeah, and and, and there's a lot there to pick up on. So I think <laughs> that the, um, the, the first thing is, yes, physically, we don't have huge amounts of information to go on. We know what the sort of the Dane traits are, the, we can guess that he probably had purple eyes. The Dane family hair seems to be all over the place, as far as we can tell. That we, the, the, unlike the Lannisters or the Starks, who know what hair color they have, the Dane family hair does seem to be pretty much all over the place, um, which is probably fair because it, it it's always it was a bit weird that just yeah the Starks only ever had one hair color, but that but that's completely by the by. But Arthur Dane had a few things we know uh, about his character. The first one, and you mentioned the Smiling Knight. So the Smiling Knight was an outlaw. He was an outlaw who was who, who was uh, rebelling against the, the kingdom, but basically just doing this kind of like, I'm sitting in a forest and, and, and stealing from people and, and pillaging and, and what are you gonna do about it? And he was uh, in his time quite, uh, a renowned figure it's I, I i don't know exactly where the quote comes from or the reference comes from but he was like the mountain of his time he was the person that everybody wanted to be able to say that they beat because he was known as being this great fighter and arthur dane was the person who finally brought him down but the point about that was not so much his prowess as the fact uh, when you were saying he allowed him to choose another sword, that Arthur Dane wanted to kill him on the basis or, or just 
defeat him in combat on the basis of their own abilities, not on the basis of the fact that he had a hugely magical sword that could just uh, overpower the other person's sword. And when the Smiling Knight's sword was just all over the place, he said, like, just get another sword and we'll, we'll try again. So the first thing we get is this hint that he was an honourable knight. There was something about him that sort of summed up being a knight. He didn't just do what had to be done in order to achieve what he had to achieve. But the thing that we hear the most about Arthur Dane is the fact that he was the best friend of Rhaegar. Now, this is, in many ways, I would argue, the defining, in terms of the story, the defining point about Arthur Dane. He became uh, Lord Commander of the Kingsguard and best friend of Rhaegar, which meant that he was actually, according to a semi-canon source, he was one of just a couple of people who were with Rhaegar when he, depending on your interpretation, <laughs> took uh, Lyanna or kidnapped Rihanna, uh, Lyanna from, Rihanna would be good, uh, from uh, uh, from just north of Harrenhal. And so he was there by his side. So he was there all along with this kind of plot, this plan to get uh, Lyanna and bring her down to the Tower of Joy. What do you think, Gemma, about this? What do you think we can learn from this friendship with Rhaegar what's what's the important point for our story in terms of the fact that they were best friends well I mean yeah it was a Jamie quote by the way the um the the smiling knight was the Rhaegar of his youth uh, that was the the mountain of his youth um yeah th this relationship was very important um there seemed to be a bit of a trio going along with sir uh, with john connington as well who was also very very close to Rhaegar, perhaps not as close as he would have liked um if the rumors are true but Rhaegar, i mean we've, we've got this picture of this chivalrous honorable knight who who always did the right thing um but the thing is and i'm i'm, I'm, I'm and i've got a lot of reg um i keep saying Rhaegar. i've got a lot of arthur dane fans in the chat uh, we've finally got a lot of arthur dane fans watching this and i'm i'm gonna just stir up the pot a little bit here <laughs> because if you were to look in the white book for example under sir barristan selmy i mean this is some serious resume going on right here. You know, we've got um, the defiance of Duskendale and that daring attack. We've got Magor the, mon the monstrous, Maelor the monstrous on the stepstones. This Barristan Selmy was very good at doing actual things. Okay, I think you know where I'm going with this, don't uh, you? Robert? I agree. Yeah, keep going. <laughs> Whereas Sir Arthur Dane. Yes, there was the whole smiling night thing. Okay, we've we've talked about that. And then he was in some tawnies with his BFF, Rhaegar. So Arthur Dane is famous for dying in an effort to prevent to protect Lyanna Stark from her brother who was coming to rescue her. Really, wasn't he? Yeah, if you want to break so, it down. Okay, so so let's go. To, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. There's, there's no sorry here. So Arthur Dane is presented as being this greatest fighter fighter ever, and and I would agree that the evidence for him being the greatest fighter ever is quite limited. It's Jamie clearly hero worshipped him. That is a lot of where we're coming from, and there were. Uh, two tourneys that I remember, I'm sure there are people who know more detail of this, that there were two tourneys that I remember that Arthur Dane entered and then was defeated by Rhaegar. And it's never clear whether this was just Arthur Dane, say, sort of like going, okay, you know what? So he's the, 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 the crown prince, I should let him win. He's my best mate, I should let him win. It's never said clearly whether that's the case, but the fact is, he did not win the tourneys. So he is recognized as being a very good fighter, 
but maybe not the greatest fighter of the age. And when we get to the Tower of and we'll come to the Tower of Joy properly in a second, I promise. But when we get there, yes, he clearly was a strong fighter, but he wasn't so magical that he could kill everybody around him. There were three great knights against Ned Stark and a handful of his mates. And and with respect, Howland Reed, everybody knew, wasn't a great fighter. The other guys we've not heard about before or since, really. They, they, they haven't been renowned as being great fighters. So really, we've got three fully armoured legends in their own lifetime kind of fighters against Ned Stark and some hangers-on. And... <laughs> So we, we shouldn't pretend that this was any kind of great victory for Arthur Dane. And in fact, there's only one victory for Arthur Dane that we can actually chalk up as being his, which was against the Smiling Knight. So I would, I would agree. He had an amazing sword. He was clearly a strong enough fighter for him to be awarded this sword by the family as Sword of the Morning but not necessarily deserving of this reputation he has as being the greatest swordsman ever. This is, of course, unless what happened at the Tower of Joy isn't entirely what we think. And, I mean, I had a very different vision, a much less literal interpretation of the Tower of Joy until the show did their flashback, which was a very literal and obvious, in my opinion, interpretation of the Tower of Joy. And I'm still not 100% sure if that's how it's going to turn out to be the case in the books. I mean, there's a lot of theories surrounding that. I mean, George R. Martin himself, and I, and I actually copied the quote because I thought it was worth um, saying, um, George R. R. Martin said, I might mention, though, that Ned's account, which you refer to, was in the context of a dream and a fever dream at that. Our dreams are not always literal. And I had always seen the Tower of Joy very different to the literal image that we are presented with. And then the show gave us very much that literal image, which, which I found very confusing. I think, in part... Dane is, he serves as a counterpoint to Jamie, very much so. Um, what's the quote? He wanted to beat Arthur Dane and on the, along the way he'd become the smiling knight or something along those lines. Um, so the, Dane is like a literary device um, to act as a contrast and to develop Jamie's character arc. But I also think House Dane itself, maybe even Arthur, if he's not dead, could play and will play a very important part in the books. Yeah, I, I, I think I would agree with that. And that actually comes on to uh, one of my patrons, uh, Cornelia, said, do you think we will see Dawn again in season eight? Uh, will the sword play a role in the Great War? And I think that this is the, the dividing line between the books and the show, is that I think the answer to that, for me is on the show actually probably no. They, we had a nod to the sword in the scene with the, the brand vision when uh, we saw it sort of rested up there against the bed, but that was it. And I think that they've not mentioned it at all. So I think that probably on the show, it's not going to have a role. In the books, I think it probably will. What What do you think on that one? I'm going to come back to the Tower of Joy in just a moment because you made a, a, a lot of points I want to pick up on. <laughs> but what, what, uh, what do you think about... That about about dawn what do you think dawn will reappear in okay. either the books or the show it, it... I'm, I'm i'm completely with you um i think the show has given um the book fans the little nod that they required it, we've had enough fuel for the prince that was promised to zora high kind of theories and speculation i swear D D read read it and just drop in these little Easter eggs because they know that we'll go wild over them. <laughs> but yeah, I think House Dane is going to be very important in the books. And, and I do have reasons for that, specific reasons, which we'll 
hopefully touch upon soon. Um, I don't want to, I keep dropping a lot of points on you. I'm very aware of that, but I, I'm very much with you. I think as far as Dawn in the show goes, we, we've seen all we're going to see, unfortunately. I, I would agree. And we've had a couple of super chats, so I just want to quickly come to them. Uh, Johnson Baptiste, $10. Thank you so much, saying, hi, Robert. Bless all the way up. Thank you so much, John. I, I really appreciate that. And uh, John actually has a channel of his own, which is not based on Game of Thrones, but it is a really good channel if you're a music fan and you just want a intelligent analysis and uh, commentary on music as well as some really good playlists and i'd highly recommend you go over and check out john's channel that's john sink baptiste so thank you very much for that uh, and we had another uh, super chat from uh, mandolin 523 five dollars thank you saying starting the train thank you very much that's very mm -hmm. kind so um i let, let's let's pick up on, and i want to come to the idea of this great house dane we talk about the great northern conspiracy we could talk about the great house dane conspiracy because there are so many thoughts about oh, yeah. it but let's pick up on the tower of joy specifically because okay. you said uh, and i think i would agree that your your view of what happened at the tower of joy was probably changed by what happened on the show. That doesn't necessarily mean you think it's going to change in the books, but it's that they took a very literal approach to what we've largely only seen in a fever dream from Ned Stark. What happened there, we we st still simply do not know. Yeah. And what I would uh, pick up on is that there is a phrase that Bran comes out with, which is something that Ned said when he was not in a fever dream. So I think we can probably trust it, which was, but for Howland Reed, Arthur Dane would have killed Ned Stark. Now that is, I think, something that we can take as truth. And in the on the show, they made it as a kind of a, there was a battle and Arthur Dane was about to kill Ned Stark, and then Helen Reed stopped that happening by killing Arthur Dane. The The question I have for you, uh, Gemma, is do you think it's possible, because that quote from Bran was quite open-ended, do you think it's possible that Howland could have prevented Arthur Dane from killing Ned Stark in a way that wasn't just a... I'm, killing him way do you think it's by some other kind of intervention that prevented arthur dane from killing ned stark absolutely yeah and that's until i saw the show's interpretation which like you said it, it could go either way it could be faithful it could be just the show's interpretation but until that moment i i i completely interpreted brand's words in a different way than a literal backstabbing um because Ned's very vague account of the Tower of Joy, it, it, it's not conclusive evidence that Sir Arthur Dane even died, which is a whole other theory. But yet, what we do know, like you said, the thing that wasn't a fever dream was that we know that Ned would have been killed if it wasn't for Howland Reed. And I saw this as Howland Reed suing for peace, pleading for Ned's life, presenting a diplomatic scenario, because there is clear precedent established to suggest that Arthur Dane would have listened, because in the Kingswood, he demonstrated very clearly that he's a man of restraint and mercy. He, he's been seen in the in his past in the very brief amount of information that we have about him. We know that he's a diplomatic man. So why would why is that one of the few things that we do know about him if it's not relevant in some way? And, and that's that was just the way I interpreted it. That, But then this whole the Ned, Arthur and Howland making a deal scenario just opens up so many cans of worms and potential, again, for the, the not dead theory. I think if anybody in this series is not dead, it's probably Arthur Dane. Oh, that's a big claim. I, I would <laughs> I would put his sister up against that. I would say if anyone in this series is it's not a Dane. A yeah. Dane. It, it, yeah. it is a Dane. I th and so yeah. there is a huge amount. And uh, guys, just 
as, as, as a random plug for something I'm going to be doing at some point soon, I'm going to be doing a series of, uh, of videos on my interpretation of what happened in Robert's Rebellion, the build-up to Robert's Rebellion, Robert's Rebellion and the Tower of Joy, because I think that there's a huge amount of um, foggy thinking and misunderstanding about what happened. So keep an eye out for that. But in in terms of what happened at the Tower of Joy, I would agree completely. I think that there is a very strong chance that Howland Reed intervened in a non-violent way to ensure that uh, everybody got what they wanted. Because when you just look at it at the face on the face of it, Ned is there, can come and say, okay, so all of your guys are dead. I recognize that there's a king or, or soon to be king born right in that tower there. Why don't we come to some deal? I think they would have all gone, okay, that's fine. We'll, we'll come to some deal. The idea that Arthur Dane would j instinctively just say, right, I'm going to kill you. It doesn't, doesn't work. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> it just doesn't resonate, does it? No, it's, it, it seems, it seems really, it doesn't, the, the few things we know about his character and indeed the few things we know about Ned's character don't, well, we know a lot about Ned's character, but, but the, none of it seems to tie in with the idea that they just fought and then the only person or the only two people standing when, were Ned and Helen Reed and then Ned went in off to the tower afterwards with just a whole load of bodies. It doesn't, that doesn't seem to work for me. So uh, the, 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 the sort of the dialogue that we have which is the and and so it begins no this is where it ends actually doesn't necessarily mean on the show it was very much interpreted as okay no it ends here because i'm going to kill you and then that's going to be the end of it that doesn't have to be how those bits of wording are interpreted this is where it ends has to be this is where this stupid war ends and that that for me is is where Ned would have come from. His primary drive was not. Everybody says it was his honor and all the rest. Of it. His primary drive was caring about his family, and the first thing that he will have wanted to do was make sure that his sister. And once he's figured out that there was uh, potentially a nephew in 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 the bargain, the first thing that he would have wanted to do was make sure that they were safe not have a fight with somebody who is trying to protect his sister. Exactly. This is the thing. They they were on the same team. They both they were both there to achieve the same thing, to protect the same people. Arthur Dane knew Ned and he knew his character. There's no way Arthur Dane would have just assumed that Ned would have killed his own nephew because he was a potential rival to his friend Robert Baratheon. And uh, the this, I mean, there's, there's a few things, and it, everything that happened after the Tower of Joy as well. That I mean, it just none of it rings true. I mean, there's clearly some shady stuff going on there, some serious shenanigans. Because Ned then went to Starfall to return the sword, Dawn. I mean, that's huge. And then a Sharadane apparently jumped off a tower, but they never found a body. I mean, come on. <laughs> and then they name the nickname of the heir to Starfall is Ned. I mean, I mean, and yes, this could be a coincidence. His name's Edric, but would they really name the heir of their entire house after the guy that killed? Arthur Dane and led to the premature death of Ashara Dane. I mean, it's just there's clearly a big missing link here, isn't there? <laughs> and I'm not I, saying I, I know what it is. I, I think I would not name my child after <laughs> the person that killed um, uh, members of my family and led to their suicides and r ruined everything that was going on. I would not, that, that would, the thought would not cross my mind unless they had actually done something great to overcome that. So I think there is clearly another layer here. I think the the, the one thing, I, I did a video ages ago called uh, something like, uh, is, is John really a Targaryen? That I now disagree with a huge amount of what I said in that video. <laughs> but the, the one thing that I stand by is that it is clearly ludicrous in the position 
that and this is the risk of taking this into a tower of joy <laughs> live stream but <laughs> ned is there if we t accept everything that was said ned is there standing with a friend of his and a screaming baby and where does he go lots of dead bodies around well okay what am i going to do with a screaming baby and a friend many miles from home i know what first of all i'm going to tear down that tower brick by brick that doesn't quite make sense why on earth would you spend all your time tearing down a tower brick by brick then i'm going to um uh, make little cans for all of these bodies when i know that all of my bannermen they'll want their bodies to be taken up north they get again that doesn't make sense and then where does he go does he first of all head off uh, back to where Robert Baratheon is, is actually becoming king, which is where the huge political issue is going on there. Does he head off to the to where his his newlywed wife is, is giving birth to his firstborn son? Or does he head off to hand back a sword to somebody? It's just like, uh, the, it, and the handing, the handing a sword is the wrong direction. It's not just like, oh, well, I'll just nip over there and like give this sword to somebody. He had to go through mountains for like a, a week or two in order to get there and then come back. This is, it makes no sense unless there was some other thing happening. And and this is something, as I say, I'm gonna get into in, in all the videos. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna try and bring this back to the Danes in a moment, but Gemma, <laughs> I clearly want to say something about that, the, the Tower of Joy, so go. Doesn't it feel as though a lot of effort was put in to prove that Sir Arthur Dane was dead? We have a cairn build, built, made from the ruinous of the Tower of Joy itself. Of the sword of the morning would never give up his sword unless he was obviously dead. And, and to prove that that sword was no longer in Arthur's possession because he's dead, that sword had to be returned to the seat of his family. It just feels like a hell of a lot of effort to prove this guy is dead has been made, which lends itself to the idea that perhaps he's not. I mean, this, this, um, th there's all sorts of theories and a Shara Dane as well, no body. I mean, like, we're, like we're supposed to be talking about Arthur Dane, but we can't really ignore the Tower of Joy in all of this, can we? We can't, and I think uh, so. A Shara Dane, I am. Uh, that's another thing that makes no sense to me. So, so she she commits suicide, uh, and the reasons for this are incredibly foggy to me, um, but because of the fact that that who whoever she loved doesn't love her, or she lost a baby, or something, that the idea that she then commits suicide seems quite extreme. Added to which, there was no body seems to suggest to me that there was something else going on there and that this happened right after ned stark pitches up with this sword for his his trek off into the wilderness to return a sword to a family that he apparently didn't really know very well um we are getting sidetracked we uh, <laughs> uh, let's 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 go to the chat because uh we've had a super chat from judy styles saying good night you'll catch you on the rewatch uh thank you very much for that and we also had a couple of uh, uh q a that um uh, i think uh, we should get to uh, the first is uh and uh I, I'm going to apologise because I've said this before. Uh, a Welsh name that I'm not even going to try and try and pronounce, uh, but uh, I hope you know who you are. Says uh, Q and A. Dawn is the only one, uh, only weapon mentioned that is not of this world or not of that world. Why would you mention an off-world weapon and not use it? Would Dawn have a role to play in the no long night? So, so Dawn just to, for clarity here so dawn is given to uh, an heir or, or a member of the family the the uh, house dane family when they have proven that they are good and strong enough to wield it so it doesn't happen in every generation it only happens to very very good fighters and so after ned stark returned it to, to starfall the the home of house dane that's where it stayed it wasn't given to anyone else and so as far as we're aware that is where it currently is but obviously when we have this talk of the war for the dawn 
and we have a sword called Dawn, then there's a kind of a link. So it, we're agreed, I think, on the show, it's not going to happen. In the books, Gemma, where do you think that Dawn, the sword, is going to fit into all of this? Um, I, 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 don't, I feel like John will get his hands on it somehow, but I just cannot figure out how that will work. I mean, I think the original plan is that Ned Dane was going to have it. There was going to be a five-year jump that was then going to be covered in flashbacks, but that got dropped, which means that um, Ned Dane is is really he was about twelve or thirteen at the time. At now, um, so that just makes him that little bit too young to wield Dawn at this point. Um, like you said, it's 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 the, it has this mythical status, and this is one of the many reasons why Sir Arthur Dane is just so awesome. He's got a meteor sword. He's got a cool house. He's got a badass title. Um, Dawn is like um, Milnir, Thor, Thor's hammer, isn't he? Let he who be worthy wield this blade. It's it's not like the Lord of Winterfell that just gets passed to the eldest son. This is this is an accolade that you have to earn um, to be called Sword of the Morning. Um, and we've got I did write down we've got Davos Dane. He was a Sword of the Morning. There was an Ulric Dane. Um, but then in the histories and lore sequence that the um, HBO do after the show, they actually showed Vorian Dane and Joffrey Dane wielding Dawn. But as far as the text goes, they've never been named Swords of the Morning. So as far as I'm aware, there's only, only three that we know of, and it's Davos, Ulrich, and Sir Arthur. So this is clearly not something that they just hand out like confetti. I don't really know what you know who, who makes the decision is it the house that makes the decision who 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 makes you know and, and what are the the qualifications required to be sword of the morning there's another title as well isn't there and this is vorian dane was known as sword of the evening what do you make of that uh, I honestly do not know what to make of that uh, and it's i would agree that it's not something that is just given out to anyone. This is something that you have to show that you're worthy of it. And it goes with the title, uh, Sword of the Morning. Sword of the Evening, I don't know anything other than the fact that the implication is that this is somebody who used it perhaps for slightly darker means uh, rather than for... Sword, Sword of the Morning implies that you're using this for good, good purposes, but... Every house has got slightly darker characters within them. So I do wonder whether that was just an, uh, um, a, a title given to him to reflect who he was rather than something they said, yeah, you have this. Everybody else was sort of the morning. You get to be sort of the evening. So I think it was just something that was said about him after the event. Okay, so more like a monko monkio, where not like not an official title, like um, the King Slayer or Lord Snow or Sam the Slayer or uh, the Mad King Ares, that kind of. So not like the official, because if you start talking about Sword of the Evening, I mean, are we going to get into Sword of the Lunchtime or Sword of the Mid Afternoon? You know, sword, sword of the sword Second of Breakfast. Yes, so yeah, exactly. Sort of daylight savings. I mean, <laughs> does this mean perhaps Dark Star will be the next? And Scott McClough has literally just taken the words out of my mouth. But Dark Star is going to be the next sword of the evening, then. That would be amazing. And I said Mjolnir, by the way, J.R. Rowley. Don't be so cheeky. You're coming on our stream tomorrow. <laughs> uh, well, we've, we've had another super chat from Nine Nichols talking about Dark Star. Saying Dark Star is innocent, nobody saw him main <laughs> uh, So why would Doran lie? Could he be the most dangerous man in Dawn because of his knowledge of the Tower of Joy? Um, I'm going to pass this one straight over to, to, to Gemma. So uh, whether he's got knowledge of the Tower of Joy, I think is quite a moot point. Whether yeah. he is innocent is, I would suggest, an even more moot point. But Ge Gemma, what, what do you think? Is, is he a, a wonderful person who didn't do any of the bad <laughs> No, 
he, he's a really horrible person. <laughs> he's like, he's like this contrast, isn't he, with Arthur Dane? It's like, and this is this is the thing about the, the house Dane itself. It, it's like, it's like George R. R. Martin forgot that he was writing these grey characters just for the purpose of House Dane. He's got Arthur Dane, who is like this archetypal, he is the knight that all the songs were written for. And, and Darkstar is the villain in all of these songs. It was like, what is going on there? And this is why I think, this is just one of the many, many reasons why I think House Dane is going to be so important. What we have to remember is the story itself over the years has morphed and changed and grown. Um, but the original premise can be found in that first book, especially those earlier chapters. And, and in those earlier chapters, several things were established. House Stark was established, House Lannister, House Targaryen, the Dire Wolves, um, Warging, the Others, House Dane. Those were the things that were initially established, which lends the, itself to the potential that these are the, the crooks of this story. These are the things that are supremely important. Um, we've got some of these sort of these titles. Have you seen these titles, Robert, in the chat? Sword of the Brunch, I was quite a fan of. Sword of the Midnight Snack. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so yeah, keep keep them coming. Sword, sword of the what? If you, if you were if you were the sword of something, what would you be the sword of? Um, uh, so I think um, just to, to to round off the dark star thing, uh, yeah, I I I I have to admit, I think he is quite a bad guy. I think he's um, clearly charismatic. <laughs> Clearly good looking, but probably not uh, not the hero of this. And um, we'll we'll pick up on some of these fantastic <laughs> or some things in just a second. Uh, when um, I, I just wanted to uh, underline something that Gemma just said, George R. R. Martin, when he started writing this series of novels, thought that he was writing a trilogy. Yes. So when he was writing the first book. He thought that this was something which he would be done with relatively quickly. And so he set up things in book one and brought in all of the themes that he wanted to be playing out in book one. So we should pay huge amounts of attention to the things which are said there. And he has since then admitted that there are some things that he emphasized in book one that if he knew he was going to be writing let's hope just seven books mm -hmm. then uh he would probably have left them until later in the arc and that one of the things just completely randomly was a mention of the isle of the uh, the the, uh, the isle of faces which comes in a couple of times in uh, the first book and he said that he would not have mentioned that until later on implying that it is actually quite important and then another one of these things is also house dane i mentioned earlier about the fact that that catelyn was in, so sensitive about ashara dane that she banned people from mentioning her a decade and a half after the last time that Ned had even seen her. So that is uh, clearly a really important point. House Dane is quite an important house, even if they seem to be quite peripheral to what's been going on in the show. Uh, but Gemma, uh, what, what if, if you were a sword of the something, uh, what would you be? Um, sort of the secrets, I suppose I would have to be, wouldn't I? I wish you'd told me beforehand and I would have thought of something really witty and cool to say, but I've got nothing. I mean, some of these are hilarious. We, we've got lots of swords of horny goats. It was going to go there, wasn't it? It was always <laughs> going to end up with sword of the horny goats. I think maybe that's what I'll go with, sword of the horny goats. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm always in favour of, of a horny goat. Um, so, uh, Sean McPherson, uh, Super Chat for $5. Thank you so much. Uh, saying, just uh, just because keep up the good work. You two are awesome. You're very kind. I would agree, indeed, that Gemma is indeed awesome. So, uh, I'm, I'm very much appreciating that. Um, uh, 
sort of the morning meals, uh, <laughs> all of the fucking chickens, sort of aluminium and tacos. So, so uh, you, you missed this, Gemma. Apparently, the way that I say tacos, as in Taco Bell, is very amusing. It's probably the same when you say it. Um, tacos. Ta yeah, taco. Well, um, oh, how are we saying? Are we saying this wrong? Tacos. I, I don't know. Well, I I claimed, uh, and apologies <gasps> by the way, anyone who's watching this not live. This is a complete digression from what you're probably wanting. <laughs> uh, but my last live stream, it, I said, oh, we don't have Taco Bell in the UK. And it set up a huge discussion about whether we do indeed have Taco Bell and in, and how I say the word taco. Um, there's no H. I know. We didn't say a H. We didn't say taco. We said taco. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I don't know. Apparently it's a thing. Um who knew? Uh, but taco. I'm still trying desperately to find any English person who has ever been to a Taco Bell. And uh, Gemma, have you ever been to a Taco Bell? I have. Yeah, there's <laughs> one about two miles down the road from where I live. Wow. I, I, what I was saying was that I have never been in any place uh, that has ever had a Taco Bell ever, which probably tells you that I've, I've clearly steered very, very far away from uh, Gemma in my entire life. It's a fairly recent place where I've been when I've been in America as well. So, yeah, I've been a few times. <laughs> uh, it's okay, not very so nice. I wouldn't go. <laughs> You're not missing I, out. Everyone tells me I shouldn't go there, but but at the same time, they want me to say it. Um, OK, so uh, why I, I want to start bringing this to a close because sure. uh, <laughs> uh, we're clearly getting um, slightly sidetracked in both Taco Bell and sort of the something. Um, but Gemma, what do you think? We, we've sort of hinted at the idea that Arthur Dane may not be dead. If you think he's alive, mm -hmm. where do you think he is? And is he Jack and Hagar? Okay. Um, if, and this is a big if. So let's just assume that he is still alive. Um, and and I really, and, and this has come up in the chat a few times now, and I do feel I, I do feel that we need to at least acknowledge the current half-hand man's radar um, spectrum of the theory. I'm not on board with that at all. I think they are character parallels, not literally the same characters. For me, if Arthur Dane is still alive, then he is um, with the Golden Company. There's a quote, and I and I pulled it up here because I read it earlier on when we were looking at his character. They found the Golden Company beside the river as the sun was lowering in the west. It was a camp that even Arthur Dane might have approved of. Compact, orderly, defensible. If that's if he's alive, that's where he is. So if he's alive, he's part of the Golden Company. Yes. Um, okay. How about you? Uh, well, I think he's dead, but um, <laughs> I, I have a feeling that. Well, I have a hope. I don't know whether hope is the right word. I have a hope that he just died a really dull death, in that. He, I, th I think he probably didn't die at the Tower of Joy. I'm going to get into this a whole lot more. Oh, uh, I, I see where it. you're going. But right. There's been a long time since then. And I think George R. R. Martin is the kind of person to say, you know what? He's hiding away somewhere. It's been a decade and a half. He wasn't, yeah, he wasn't an old man, but he also wasn't a young man. Some people do just die. And and I think that that might well be how that is. It, it's uh, I think that he he's clearly was such a, a, a charismatic figure with recognisable eyes. At least one thinks that if he were out there in the world, people would have picked up on it. So probably he just hid away somewhere, and maybe just isn't isn't around. I I. I instinctively do not like the idea of that somebody is somebody else the uh, and i was yeah. joking apologies people in the chat who think it was a good idea i instinctively dislike that such and such a person is jack and hagar theories i i don't like any of them i have to say that i i just think george R. R. martin is such a realist in the way that he does things that he would just say you know what this guy just didn't survive 
that's so depressing that he was in on this whole conspiracy and he went off to to wait for the true king so he could one day and then just like died of something really lame off page that's really really depressing <laughs> it's very george r, r. martin it, it is and i think that somebody has to just die in a lame way off page surely and and why not him I so there know. you have it so arthur dane died in a lame way that's his new tag <laughs> yeah so so i think i think in this where we're getting to is the fact and uh, please tell me if i'm wrong and what we're agreeing but he wasn't as great a fighter as everyone makes him out to be he lost to Rhaegar, he clearly, uh, the, the only win that we know about was uh, against the Smiling Knight, and that seemed to be as much as anything about his sword rather than him. So all of the legends about him seem to be slightly overblown, but he clearly was a strong friend of Rhaegar. What happened at the Tower of Joy, we don't think, was what we saw on the show. We think that there's a chance that he may well have survived that, but we don't know where he could possibly be, so I think that he just died of a bad cold, uh, and, and just like it's a miserable, sad end. He died Would of you a disagree death with death. any of that, Gemma? Uh, probably, but I can't be bothered to get into that. <laughs> we'll go with that. Died, sort of died in a lame way. That's what we're going with. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think, and I was slightly tongue in cheek about that, but I think that, uh, <laughs> what I what I like to do, and and we did this with Rick on uh, a few weeks ago. Do please check that out, uh, that live stream out if you uh, if you're interested. What I like to do is take these kind of slightly minor characters and say, you know what, what we've what we understand about them is probably not completely right and i think that's the case here with arthur dane yes he was clearly a good fighter but he probably wasn't the greatest fighter in the entire world ever yes he was um uh, probably a good and noble person but we actually don't know huge amounts of good and noble things that he did beside that one thing with with uh the smiling knight um and uh, yes he may well have survived but he doesn't appear to have shown himself anywhere, which makes us wonder where he might be. And in the absence of any other information, I'm going to say that's because George R. R. Martin likes killing people. Yes, he certainly likes doing that. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I mean, one of the other theories is that he's just hanging around at Greywater Watch with Howland Reed. Um, who knows um i don't think he's going to make an appearance i actually think um there's a there's a possibility that both ashara and arthur are still alive but i think in if we've seen one and not fully realized it it's scepter limor and it's uh, ashara um i don't think we're going to see sir arthur dane again i think he's just going to remain as the legend of the sword of the morning forevermore i i would agree and and guys this is your chance to put any final questions down in there down there in the chat uh i was just going to pick up on something uh stephanie peer one of my uh patrons says uh in reference to the my slightly bleak uh, understanding of what might have happened uh, to Arthur Dane saying, but you could use the same argument about Howland Reed. I think with Howland Reed, we have actually got a uh, some people who know him being his two children, and they talk about him in the present tense rather than in the past tense. So uh, we we see that um, um, Jojen says that my father sent me and that implies that his father was still alive until somewhere at least somewhere in the books whereas with uh, arthur dane we haven't heard anything we don't know anyone who says whether he's alive or dead it's just like a a blank sheet so i think there's there is a different position there uh with between those two characters i think howland in my view, clearly is alive. And based on what George R. R. Martin has said, 
we will meet him again in the books and that will be quite an important uh, moment because he has he has got the information about what happened at the Tower of Joy and various other things going on. So let's have a quick look in the chat there. Um, as I say, we've got, we, let's take a couple of questions before we go. Um, uh, Freemius B says, you're probably right about Arthur Dane being dead, but if he's alive and hasn't shown himself, it's because he's disguised, uh, yet yeah, disguised or just hiding, I guess. Um, <laughs> Tyler um, D said that Arthur was strolling back home, came across a Taco Bell, ate there and died <laughs> well we, we've taken this quite a bleak way i have to say i wasn't i wasn't fully expecting this uh, yeah. uh nicole uh, huffman says do you believe arthur dane is still alive i've seen some compelling theories that ashara is set to lamour and arthur dane is also alive beyond the wall um i think uh I personally believe that there's a good chance that Ashara Dane is definitely alive. In terms of Arthur Dane, I, I've i not seen any compelling evidence to suggest that he's anyone. Uh, when you say beyond the wall, I don't know who that might be. Gemma, have you seen any kind of hints or evidence that, that, that anyone, any specific people might be Arthur Dane? Um, no. Not compelling, no. Um, I'm aware of the theories about Corin Halfhand and Mance Raider, but I don't find those compelling at all. Um, there is, however, compelling evidence for Ashara in Septa Limor. Um, Limor, um, spelled slightly differently, actually means death, which suggests this is perhaps a character that we think is dead. So, you know, that there, there is perhaps that that's that's perhaps a hint. Um, but this is Arthur, not Ashara. Maybe we should talk about Ashara another time. Yeah, why why don't we do that actually? Why don't we have uh and, and I really enjoyed and, and guys to, to tell me if if I'm just enjoying something you're not, but I really enjoy doing these these uh, sessions with with Gemma, where we take a character who's perhaps not a central character, but one that everybody always talks about or theorizes about. Why don't we do the next one about Ashara Dane? Okay. And because there's a lot of history there about what happened there at the tourney at Harren Hall, and then where did she go next? And lots of theories about where she might be after that. But uh, I quite like. So I'm putting Gemma on the spot here, but I quite like Gemma to do that as next time you come on here to, to, to talk about Ashara. What do you reckon? Absolutely, because it will just trigger the hell out of Kyle as well. So let's do it. I'm, I'm always in favour of triggering the hell out of Kyle, it has to be said. Um, the And and talking of which, hi, uh, Azora Hype and LML are both out, in there, out there in the chat. Um, uh, LML, incidentally, is coming on next week. Uh, same time uh, for a similar discussion talking about Bran and what we're going to do is not just talk about Bran as a sort of a random character but we're going to try and dig into all of the foreshadowing and all of the uh, the amazing mythical astronomy stuff that LML just has at his fingertips to try and get into what on earth is his role in the end game because so far Bran is just like been training to be a tree wizard but what happens to him next what what hints have we got about what ha might happen to me next so that's what's going to be happening next week here next thursday same time as we've got lml on uh, and that's going to be a lot of fun uh, Gemma, is there anything you want to uh, just sort of sum up on all, all all of this discussion before we uh we uh just pull this one to a close no, I mean, I think we've we've pretty much covered Arthur himself. I mean, if you start getting into, you know, much deeper into House Dane and fallen stars from the sky and meteors, I mean, that's a conversation that LML, I know, would be very keen to get his teeth into. Um, the history of the Danes themselves is is very broad for theorizing. We've got a shower, we've got Dark Star, but I think we've pretty much got Arthur nailed at this point. Um, we've debunked the ones we don't like, and we've explored the ones that are more interesting, and concluded that he probably died in a lame way. 
<laughs> Excellent. And uh, in honour of that, you've had purple eyes all the way through this. So, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, uh, so, Gemma, as I always do, what is there anything you want to just uh, highlight? Uh, I should say, Secrets of the Citadel, if you have never checked out the channel, really do go and do it. So Gemma does a fantastic job, not just the, the kind of the theory stuff that a lot of people do, but she goes through chapter by chapter through the books of A Song of Ice and Fire and really digs deep. So if you're if you're a book person, then I would highly recommend you go over and check out Secrets of the Citadel. But is there anything you would like uh, to just draw to people's attention about uh, stuff you're doing or where to find you on the internet? Um, yeah, I, I always forget my links. What is it? I'm Secrets of the Citadel on Instagram. That one's easy. I am Gemma Stark on Facebook and I am at Citadel Secrets on Twitter and I'm Secrets of the Citadel on YouTube. Um, yeah, I mean, most of you in the chat know who I am anyway. You know what I'm about. Yeah, I'm, I'm currently, I'm going through the show and the book in, in separate ways. Um, I'm doing a lot of narration at the moment for my Patreons, which I'm really enjoying, and I know they're really enjoying. Tomorrow night, um, I'm doing a, um, a live stream on Kyle's channel, and we're having a few of our Patreons come on with us on the actual live stream. So that's just going to be carnage, which is going to be great. Really looking forward to that. Um, and that's about it. For now, I mean, like I said, most of you guys know me anyway, don't you? Thank you, Robert, for having me on your channel. It's been an absolute pleasure talking about the Sword of the Morning with you. Excellent. And and uh, I would just say in terms of stuff that I've got coming on, uh, I, as most of you know, I've been focusing a lot on Westworld over the last few weeks. So that's been a big part of what I've been doing. But I've got a lot of new projects coming up for over the course of the next couple of weeks. I've mentioned it a few times before, I've got a new channel that I'm doing called The Well Told Tale. There's a link down there in the description if you're interested in that. It's going to be me narrating the best science fiction, fantasy, speculative fiction stories ever written. It's gonna be long form, at least half an hour for each episode, one a week on a Wednesday, just going through some amazing uh, literature. So we're going to start with The War of the Worlds, we're going to go on to Frankenstein, and we're just going to go through all of the, the best science fiction ever written, just narration, no ads in the middle just to disrupt things, just, uh, just me reading the story. So that's something I'm really looking forward to. I'm also going to start up another couple of series on Game of Thrones uh, in terms of video series. I've already talked about the... Uh, the Robert's Rebellion and the Tower of Joy series they're going to be doing. I'm also setting up, as of next week, there'll be a new series on questions that, that serious fans of the show and the books have, the kinds of things that people are still asking, that, that are nagging at the back of your mind that you actually do not know. So the first question, which I will hopefully be answering in a video coming up in a few days' time, is, are Sansa and Tyrion actually still married? This is a question which seems to come up a huge amount. Um, uh, I'm sure Gemma knows the answer to this one straight away, so I'm not going to ask her, but I'm going to sit down. <laughs> that out in a video. Everyone seems quite confused by this, but I think I I think I have worked my way through it. So if you want to know the answer to that one, check out that video. But guys, um, uh, that's uh, that's all for this time. If you if you enjoy the channel, if you're a regular viewer, please do check out my Patreon page. Uh, if you want to support the channel, that's the, that's the way to go there. We'll get access to some more uh, content, exclusive content I produce for my patrons. Um, but uh, that's it for this time. Thank you again, Gemma. It's always a pleasure having you on. Um, and uh, I will see everyone again this time next week for LML talking about Bran. Take care, guys, and I will see you soon. Bye. Bye.